Greetings and welcome to the 31st Historic Calgary Week. My name is Sherry Pyle and I would like to thank you for coming to the Alberta Family History Society presentation, Succession Proofing Your Family Study. Now I will hand the Zoom microphone over to Jim. Okay, thank you very much, Sherry. Uh, this is a topic uh, close to my heart, succession proofing of your, your family study. I've done this presentation to a few other people, but I'm very involved both with the local society, Alberta Family History Society, and also with the Guild of One Name Studies on assisting people in preserving all the studies that they've put together over many, many years. Uh, and people have done it in various uh, forms, formats, uh, places to store things. And having come from, as uh, my intro would uh, mentioned from a shoebox of photographs from my mother and family, um, I thought there must be a better way to do this. But we all evolve through the stages of, of preserving things uh, going along. And I, I'd like to discuss the, uh, the stages that you yourself might be uh, experiencing. Let's see if I can get computer advancing here. There we go. Ah. I'm going to introduce you to the seven stages of succession proofing your family study. I don't know what stage you might be at. You might not even be sure yourself. If you're at any stage, what more can you do? Uh, all of us uh, who have done family studies that have parked ourselves at these uh, various stages in life, struggling hard to try to make some order and, and semblance in, in organizing of, of what our family studies are going to be. Not only organizing it, but how do I uh, preserve it? How do I protect it? How do I pass it on to the next generation? What format will they want to have our information in? So let's walk through the seven stages of succession proofing together and you decide what stage you uh, are at yourself. So we're going to go on to the first stage of succession proofing. Now your families and friends are always amused with your passion of searching for dead relatives you talk to them about old grandfather Elmo and his farmstead in southern Saskatchewan. Their eyes start to glaze over as you recount the latest graveyard crawl in Estevan. The spouse is just not as enthused over another genealogy conference trip, yet again in Salt Lake City. You know, it's great that you have amassed a remarkable collection of memorabilia, remnants of the family's past. When you do go, will you pass it forward? Can you ensure that your history hoarding will also become your legacy? Which of the seven stages of succession proofing are you stuck in today? Stage one, this is a personal hobby of mine. And except for my family obligations of responding to questions on the name, I have no plans to archive it or pass it along to anyone else. This, is going to be buried with me. Well, this is quite acceptable. If that's what you want, it's your collection after all. No one else did it. It's mine, all mine. So I'm gonna have it incinerated and mixed in with my cremation ashes. Yes, you can take it with you. Well, let me introduce you now to Mr. Ray Luxton. He's a professional grave digger in the Somerset area and has been for some 40 years. He's waiting for you and your stuff. Maybe you're at stage two. This is a personal hobby of mine, but someday I might drop it off at my local library or at my nephew's house so they can sort it out. A lot of us are stuck here or are quite happy here. We are the people of the paper pyramids, the genealogy hoarders, tripping over newspaper piles, navigating around stacks of books on the floor. We toil on, pencil and eraser in hand, late in the night, carefully transcribing from computer screen back to paper form. Now, just where did I leave that print out of the 1911 Alberta census? <sighs> Guess I'll have to print off another copy. You might be at stage three. It's all in paper form. Don't need a computer to store it. The cardboard boxes work just fine. 
Yes, I have it all organized, cross-indexed, tagged with recipe-sized index cards. The family charts are filled out. The family description pages are now complete. Everything is sorted, color-coded, filed in three-ring binders. Congratulations, you are ahead of the pack. At least half of us other amateur sleuths cannot claim to be that far along. If this is all you have done or can do, it's a major accomplishment, but you're not done yet. What happens in the event of a flood, a house fire, or a water pipe break? Your collection could be attacked by rodents, paper-loving insects, mold, sunlight, excess heat, excess moisture, lack of moisture, the ravages of time. Paper does not last forever. And who inherits all the research? Please check over your latest will and make sure someone, whether a family member or the local society is named as a beneficiary. Because once you go, only your last testament will control. And oh, by the way, get that book published that you promised to Aunt Mabel. So why do people do family charts anyway? Why do we keep track of uh, our ancestors going down? Well, because it's a hobby. But actually, if you go way back in antiquity, it had a more serious purpose. This scroll, which is shown in detail in the big picture, and then just to the right, the full scroll uh, in miniature, is a descendancy chart of English kings. And what you're doing is uh, by having it properly charted and going way back, you proved that you descended from God, or at least somebody close to God. And that gave you the right to be the, the, the king of the realm and leader of all within it. If, it. if your chart doesn't show the right information, you could be subject to an overturn or a beheading. Um, this chart shows, for example, King Edward here on the chart on the detail chart and uh, he's also shown over here on the main chart so king edward can show that he does have a, a, a descendancy line going back to well, in this case the top of his chart is noah he is descended from noah uh, you may or may not believe that but he's got it on paper and therefore he is entitled to be the king of, of all um, this is proof that he is descended from noah so there's a very practical purpose way back in the days of antiquity. Uh, I don't think any of you need to necessarily do that, but some of us get tickled pink if uh, we find out we're related to uh, somebody of fame, somebody from uh, Hollywood, or, uh, or perhaps uh, you might be entitled to a castle in Scotland, you never know. Um, now, I also have my own collection of papers. So this is kind of me at stage three or when I used to get stage three. I've got my three ring binders on the shelf. I've got books on the shelf. I've got uh, reference uh, publications. Some of the boxes have photographs. Some of the boxes have uh, slides and uh, even an old computer sitting on, on the very top shelf. And I still refer to those. I mean, I find sometimes it's faster to get to my paper copy of something instead of having to go through the computer. So there's, those are still of value. Uh, this is the inside of one of the three ring binders, showing everything uh, protected in plastic and nicely tabbed uh, with a, a tree uh, diagram on the lead in page. So I qu quickly know, okay, this is my research on uh, Joseph Atchison. And if I flip the page over, uh, there I have more details on individuals in it. Um, in, in addition to that, um, I was very fortunate to have an aunt that published a book, a soft cover book on the family line, and she titled it, Who's That Sitting in Our Family Tree? By my aunt, Gert Lori, born Weber. She is uh, pictured in, in the photograph on the left. She's in the upper left, and my mother's in the lower right. This is a, a picture that's treasured by all of my cousins on that side of the family. 
uh, it shows the, the five sisters uh, who were uh, born and raised in Rosenfeld, Manitoba. Uh, they might, uh, ended up in Winnipeg and from Winnipeg uh, arrived in, uh, in Calgary uh, in about the 1930s. And there's a bit of a story on that. My grandfather was a, a, a bit of a, uh, I'll try, uh, a man who thought he was well to do as long as he could have money, which he, he rarely ever had. So uh, a few years after getting married and burning through the family money and then ending up in uh, Winnipeg in a rental house, he heard that, uh, go west, young man, to earn your fortune. So he popped the train and went out to Calgary to see if he could get a job out that way. Well, he was out that way. He spent more money at the bar and was running low. So he sent a telegram back to uh, his wife, my grandmother, asking for more money. He said, if I had another $40, you know, I'd be able to see it through and get that job. So if she telegraphed back the money to him, the telegraph operator made a slight mistake. The telegraph arrived in Calgary saying $400, which if you go back to the 30s, was a minor fortune. At that point, he thought, wow, the family came into an estate inheritance. Somebody must have died. He immediately telegrammed back and said, pack up your bags, put the kids on the train, come on out to Calgary. This is where we're going to live. And that's how I got my roots started in Calgary. So, but these, these make fascinating stories and they're all in a little booklets like that. So I am just going to now go to my own screen here and show you. Uh, and um, Sherry, I, I take it, uh, this is visible. Uh, this is the book. And it's just chock full of photographs, but also of stories on the family line going way, way back. And it's a treasure to the family. Uh, my aunt Gert spent years writing this book. She was a, a retired school teacher, so she, she had a great wit and a great way of words. And she put this book together. She made 200 copies, privately printed. Uh, she uh, lived in uh, Victoria, BC area. And uh, when it was time to uh, release the book, she and her son drove all the way uh, across BC into Calgary, arrived in the backyard of one of my cousins in 1988, and she proudly distributed the book to everyone that was there. It went to my aunts and uncles. It also went to my cousins. And there's two groups of people reading the book. Myself and my cousins would look through this book and say, wow, I didn't know that about grandfather. My mother and her sisters and uncles would say, oh my God, she wrote about the old man. At that point, the stories were really starting to come out on things. There's other ways you can also publish books. You don't have to do it that way. This is a book put together by my daughter-in-law, Janelle. It's a book based on the weekend of having a family reunion. And this is some 80 odd members of my family that came together in Calgary back in 2018. And Janelle, I got to turn this this way, ended up taking photographs all through the weekend, of all the people here and identifying them. Then, and she's done this before, then she has a special software application that allows her to enter in all the photographs with all the text, do the various formatting. So you can see it's not just the photographs, but also the styling of things, she, that was all under her control. She's not a computer expert, but uh, she has an eye for doing art. And then she hits the button and a book publisher in uh, Toronto, I believe, ends up converting it into a hardcover book. And then she prints off as many copies as, as needed for people that attended the uh, family reunion. And now I have a book that goes on the shelf of a wonderful gathering of all of my relatives. And now that's being preserved. And it's also in the hands, not only of my uh, daughter-in-law and my son, but also our grandchildren. So it's being passed along 
to the rest of the family. The last book I want to sh show you is I did mention that once you have your uh, uh, publication or all, all of your research put together, how do you pass that along to uh, somebody else? How do you, one of the ways you preserve it is to make sure that your information appears in your will somewhere. And this is what I've got. I've got a binder, paper binder, and in it, I've got a copy of, the, of our will. I got a copy of all of the websites where I store my information, password access and so on. Now that sits on a certain place on my bookshelf and a copy is in the hands of my son. So that if anything happens to me, they have all the information needed to access my research. So let's carry on with the story here. And again, if there's any questions you have along the way, just, just drop them into the chat box and we'll have time later on for uh, going through them. So here we are again. Uh, and I wanted to talk about a certain project I have myself. The um, one of my one of my research areas is the Benedict line, my my surname, my father's surname, my grandfather's surname, and so on and so forth. And I have uh, taken on a very strong interest in recording all things Benedict. And so I have acquired two books that have the, the, the storyline of the Benedicts starting back in 1638. This was after the Mayflower, but in the same region. When the, the Benedicts arrived from, uh, from England into North America. And these two books, volumes one and two, are the, um, all the family descendant lines from that initial family going all through all Benedicts in North America. They're incredible volumes. Volume one was uh, published by uh, Henry Benedict in 1870 originally. And then uh, another fellow by the name of Elwin Benedict uh, picked up uh, the thread some decades later, and carried on and he, and he did a publication in 1960. It's a, an incredible amount of work to do this sort of thing, especially when it's not your direct family line, but all Benedicts. How he did it. This is Elwin Benedict and his wife, Esther. Uh, they have both passed on, but they lived in East Syracuse, a uh, state of New York. And I've made uh, a number of trips out to their house over the years to meet with them. El Esther was the one that uh, manual, had a manual typewriter and she typed up the entire volume two in great detail. Uh, if any mistakes were made, she'd have to retype the whole page. Elwin is the one that would do the research. Uh, Elwin and Esther uh, would, would take their vacation time and would travel through the, the lower 48 states looking for Benedicts. Elwin uh, worked for a Carrier Air Conditioning Company, and the, the factory would be shut down for a couple of months of the summer. So he packed the whole family up, uh, car, trailer, the two boys, and out they would head. And to listen to uh, one of the sons on, uh, on a holiday trip, they'd, uh, they'd pull into uh, a town on the trip. The first thing Elwin would do would be to get out of the car, go to the nearest telephone booth, haul out the telephone book, and see if there's any Benedicts. No Benedicts, they drive on. Benedicts, they then head to the cemetery and they would then start scouring through all the headstones looking for any Benedicts names and getting it recorded. And Ellen would write down all the information from the phone book and when he would get home, they would send out uh, by postal uh, a questionnaire for people to fill in and send information to them. They finally got volume two published in 1960. But people didn't stop sending information to Elwin. That file cabinet you're looking at is full of manila folders of information people were hoping he would publish volume three. That's one filing cabinet. There's three filing cabinets that were in the house. Oh, and this is one corner of the bedroom. Cardboard boxes upon cardboard boxes of stuff piled up. 
this is one of the really severe cases of, uh, of stage three collecting of family histories. Uh, Esther could no longer type. She was completely uh, crippled up with arthritis in, in the hands from uh, the years of uh, work that she did on the book. And so I volunteered to come in and try to do it computer-wise. So I did digital scanning of as much of that information as I can. Not finished yet, but I figured that all of the paper that they have, if you stacked it one-on-one -on -one in a pile, it'd be about three stories high. That's pretty severe researching. Hopefully you guys are not at that uh, degree of intensity. But you might have now moved into the digital age and gone on to stage four. It's all on floppy disks. Substitute, external hard drive, zip drive, floppy disk, punched cards. Don't worry, the local society will figure it out. We are all astounded by the speed of technology advances everywhere and no less by the improvements of computers. You can have your entire family research in the palm of your hand. Yes, your smartphone can house the entire digital, digital vault of all your family research, which is a bit unnerving, don't drop it. What happens as new technology overtakes the slightly older version? I'll bet that your bottom desk drawer still has an old floppy disk tucked away, storing an even older backup copy of the family files. My own room has a shelf of antique five and a quarter inch floppies, burnable CD and DVD blanks, all gathering dust. Instead, these days I use external USB hard drives and pocket-sized USB memory sticks. They are handy, fully compatible across many machines, and reusable. What's not to love with the new stuff? Except, as obsolescence comes along about every two years, we have to move all the information across the new tool. Even the software applications cry to us every few years to have the next update installed. So now your 10 year old data files become unreadable with the latest version. Do you have a, a regular schedule of refreshing your backups and being prepared to replace equipment as, and not if, it becomes obsolete? Don't expect your heirs or the local history society to have to sort out genealogy files that are totally unreadable or inaccessible. Maybe you're on stage five. I've got it carefully stored on my home computer, all neatly indexed and entered into my favorite family tree application. Now, hopefully my relatives can remember my login password to get into the file someday. Talk about the, uh, and all the different computer applications you can work with. And these are things you can uh, have installed and running on your, your local home computer. Some of these are also available uh, to operate on uh, laptops and uh, on uh, notepads and the like. Uh, Family Tree Maker is one of the longest uh, running, uh, more popular programs. Uh, more advanced people are not that happy with it. And they have things like Family Historian and Legacy and Roots Magic and on and on it goes. Uh, you can certainly find the, the different packages that are out there. Family Tree Maker, you used to be able to pick up at your local store or Staples. Uh, then it was Costco you'd have to go to. And now you pretty much have to order anything you want like that online. But it is a way to record your family information, uh, ancestors, descendants, uh, family diagrams, um, handy printouts uh, of charts and the like. And, and all of the packages all do the same basic thing and uh, there's a certain amount of compatibility between them as well. But a lot of people use those for, uh, for putting together fa their family information. So now we're into the digital age. You have the family line at your fingertips. The paper pile can become a bonfire. Freedom at last from paper cuts and staple jabs. But pause for a moment. 
you have the key to the information flow. Does your family? Be aware, if you pass away without leaving password access, the first thing that goes on the rubbish bin will be that clunky old computer that no one wants, and they can't even get into it because of login password blockage. Bear in mind that uh, state planning binder that, uh, that I showed you. So what to do? Talk to an estate planner or a wills lawyer. Add a memorandum or a codicil to the will regarding digital assets. This will cover who gets the computer and backup devices, what is the login information, the locations of the most precious files on the computer, and then your dispersal wishes for each line item. And do it soon. Stage six. I have it all online. No problem. There are chunks of it on ancestry, my heritage, find my past, family search. Golly, I'm also on Facebook, Flickr, Instagram, and Twitter. You can find bits and pieces of my family all over the internet. You really have it covered and everywhere. How will your heirs ever piece it together? This is a new challenge that we are just entering, but it is now what the next generation is totally comfortable with, living in that virtual space. To them, this is how you do family connections, birthdays, marriages, careers, and yes, death. Although we might hate it, this may very well be the future of genealogy. Technology is just starting to probe into how all of this can be connected together, retrieved, and archived. Should you trust the internet? So relax, there's not much you can do with it now, except try not to have too much duplication in multiple areas, such as dates and events. Somehow you should have one master repository that is the correct one your reference, the one you point to for family matters, and let your executor find it in the will. Finally, stage seven, the last frontier. It's up in the internet somewhere. This is the final frontier. Your family research has gone virtual. No more paper piles, perhaps not even a computer in sight. You can do all research online, store online, see it anywhere in the world online. Not bad, but keep in mind all the cautionary notes we talked about earlier will still apply. So have fun in the hobby, but please keep in mind this. You want to do onto the next generation what you wish those darn ancestors of yours could have done for you. There, there's some tools that I particularly like that have helped me in, in uh, moving along in my study itself. One that I became aware of recently, it's called Ancestral Author. Now we're, we're gonna uh, have this information available for you, but Ancestral Author is a, is a way to convert uh, the information you have in your family tree maker or, or roots magic or, or even ancestry and make it into a book. There's a free trial version available. Uh, it leaves a watermark on, on the pages, but if you like what you see, then uh, you, you can subscribe to the package. And I'm going to show you how I'm gonna publish this book on my mother in about five minutes. On screen, you should see ancestral author self, and we're going to create a storyline on uh, on my my own mother here and see how it goes. If you guys want to time me for the five minutes, uh, please go ahead. So on ancestral author, when you bring it up, uh, there, there's a menu area here, and there's a white blank square which uh, we're going to fill in shortly, and then there's a button down here that says create PDF. PDF is a, is a document that uh, 
you can uh, print off, you can, so you can make a paper copy of it or you can view it on screen. A lot of you would be familiar with Adobe PDF documents. We're going to end up actually creating one. So how do we do this? Well, starting with ancestral author, uh, you've got these tiles over here with various names on them and you can actually click these things and you can drag and drop them off in the white box. So I'm going to drop title page on here and I'm going to put in, type in a title. That's my mother's name. And optionally, I'm going to add in a byline. So I'm going to say the life of Winnie Weber, and then her married surname, Benedict. And then I'm going to add a picture. And to add the picture, I've got a little pop up box here. And we are going to look for uh, projects, presentations, succession proofing, ancestral ancestor. And we are going to pick this picture to go onto the title page. There we go. Okay. Then we are going to add a table of contents, which I will call very original of me. Table of contents, I'll say okay. And then I'm going to add in a heading at the top of the next page, which is the narrative. And now we're going to uh, add, this is what I'm doing here. So I, I'm working on the import files. I'm going to add some images and I'm going to be adding uh, 107, 108. And you can see on the bottom here where it's starting to fill them in. I'm going to add 118 and the wedding picture open. There we go. Now, I'm also going to say that I want this picture to be in the upper right. This one to be in the lower left. And this one I'm going to put in the lower right. I'm going to say OK on that. And then I'm going to add another heading in here. And it'll make more sense when I'm all done. Whoever ancestors will be a heading. And then I'm going to actually now import the whole family tree information in, in one fell swoop here. And we are going to uh, now import what's called a GEDCOM file. I'll explain later what that is, but for now. And uh, it's going to start off with the person at the top of the chart is going to be Joseph Weber. And the program has found Joseph Weber. You notice, just typed in the name, but it has found a Joseph Weber, birth in 1840 in Alsace, France, died in 1907 in Cambridge, Ontario. I have a quick look. Yep, that looks about right. I'll say OK. And so I've got the descendant information in. And I'm going to add one more thing, adding by heading, person index, OK. And now I'm going to drag something called the index in here. And two column index, beautiful, looks good. OK, fantastic. I'm done. I hope I was within the five minutes. Well, I haven't created it yet. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, cheat a little bit and drag in my creation of it before. So this is a this is what I created a, a few days ago, and it's identical to what I was trying to do this time around. It's a book in PDF format. That's what I called for on the title page, Winifred Kathleen Weber with picture, The Life of Winnie Benedict. I'm just going to make sure that my scrolling here works the way I want to. So I'm going to scroll down 
table of contents, and a narrative. All that text I imported as a text file into uh, the application, and I told them what, what picture I wanted to have on it. Here's a narrative, and we scroll down, more information. Here's the photo gallery that I called for. That's the four photos I wanted to have in it, and I decided which ones will be in the upper left, upper right, lower left, lower right, nicely positioned. Uh, and then uh, I had one more at the e end, which is my mother, you know, and <laughs> that, that, that's a style back in the, in the 20s. I figured she was uh, uh, 20, uh, younger than 20 at that time with the wavy hair and styles. I just love that picture of my mother. Uh, she, I think she had a lot of fun back then. Then here is the descendant chart that I asked for. I didn't type any of this information up. This was computer generated from my family studies. All this information, starting off with Joseph Weber, going down through his children, and then uh, uh, Emil Joseph Rusi Weber was my grandfather and his children. Here's my mother going down, and there's my aunts and uncles. Here's the information on my mother, Winifred Kathleen Winnie Weber and her children. There's my sister, myself, my brother listed here, and it goes on to several more children. Because this is a PDF, uh, this is not shared on a website anywhere. It's what I print off personally for my own use and also sharing directly with my family. Now at the end, we have a person index. Here's all the people that appear in this document. Not only do they appear in the document organized by surname, but also I can click on any of these to go to that particular person. So I can go to, for example, uh, here's my, my son, Ethan Jonathan Benedict. He appears on page 12. I can click on page 12 and here he is at the top of the list. So I've ended up with a 15 page book in about five minutes. That's just one tool that you can use. Now, yes, it does mean that you set up your whole family chart information in an application somewhere, but you were planning to do that anyway. The difficult thing is once you get it into a computer application, now you want to have a book. How you do? How do you do that? Well, this this ancestral author is one example tool for being able to do that. What's another way you can work on your family studies and help preserve it? Well, you could join a society. And in Calgary, the one to join would be the Alberta Family History Society. Uh, its website is afhs.ab.ca. And it's been in operation in Calgary for a little over 40 years. We have about uh, 230, 240 members in Calgary and surrounding area. And we have uh, all kinds of volunteers and, and different levels of, of experts available. We host regular meetings, except for uh, July and August. And we have uh, general meetings that take place. Uh, we also have what we call special interest groups. Uh, these are uh, uh, members that are focused on a particular aspect of uh, doing family studies. It might be um, people that are interested in um, uh, people that were born and raised in the United Kingdom. It, uh, it could be Celtic, yeah, that is uh, Irish. Uh, it could be, if we have a group that's interested in uh, families that come from Ontario, for example. Some of the groups specialize in certain software applications. So a family tree maker and so on and so forth. We also have our own library, which is open to the public. It's located on 16th Avenue in the area of 7th and uh, 8th Street, Northwest. So it's right on uh, the Trans-Canada uh, Roadway, Main Road, um, and, and it's a full-blown library. We have over 10,000 volumes, and I'm underestimating that. You can see one of the uh, six bookshelves in the background and a number of our volunteer slash experts that help each other and help any visitors. You go to the AFHS website if you know when it's open to the public, but generally uh, uh, right now it's running uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays and Saturdays for about four hours each day. 
and uh, the volumes uh, are available for you to view and, and even borrow certain volumes as well. They can help you out. So uh, go, go to the website to get more information and uh, come on down to the library, it's great. At this, this time, uh, I believe we would like people to call ahead before showing up during, the, uh, uh, during this uh, uh, COVID-19 situation, but, but normally it handles walk-in traffic. There's all kinds of resources. There are computers uh, that you can use, uh, photocopying, uh, scanning, um, and, and so on and so forth. It's, it's a tremendous resource available. So if you want to work on your family tree with other like-minded people, the Alberta Family History Society is a great place uh, to come and join up. We also uh, work uh, with the uh, 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 Calgary Public Library, so uh, and they recognize us and support us in all kinds of endeavors, presentations, and so on and so forth. That'd be a, a great way for you to uh, get your feet wet and see uh, see what else uh, you could be doing on your family studies. You could start a family website. Now, this is not for the faint of heart. But if you happen to have uh, a son or a daughter or a niece or a nephew or somebody you can tap into that's a computer expert, you may want to go that way. And a lot of people uh, do go that way to set up their own website. Some people say, well, I don't know how to set up a website, but I could use uh, uh, something like Ancestry. And Ancestry is one of the most popular worldwide places where you can put your family tree and uh, have all of your information on there, photos on there, and so on and so forth. There's, there's other competitive uh, sites like uh, MyHeritage is one, the, um, uh, the, the uh, church, uh, the LDS church uh, has a place called uh, FamilySearch.org, which is absolutely fantastic and a tremendous resource for uh, documents such as census, uh, birth, marriage, death certificates, uh, immigration uh, information, and so on. Go to the Alberta Family History Society library and talk to the people there. They can show you examples and, and have you uh, uh, actually have a look at what's available and you, you might find all kinds of information. However, the AFHS Society in itself also is set up to uh, preserve and archive people's family studies. And we have a site called Family Genes, www.familygenes.ca, and on it, we have about 40 uh, family studies that have been preserved on the site using a special tool that's nicknamed TNG, which stands for the Next Generation of Genealogy Site Building. And it is, the thing is set up so that you're, you're basically, Basically, we set it up for you. There's a one-time licensing fee that, that gets paid to the software developer, and then we assist you in going forward. So for example, uh, this, this is one of my family uh, lines here. This is my, my Weber family. I introduced you to my mother uh, on this site. This is my, my grandfather, her father, Emil Joseph Weber. And uh, this is... Uh, on that website, this is uh, an ancestor's chart, but I can hover over any person here and I can actually see information on the children. From here, I can click on any name and, and see further information. So for example, if I wanna see the information on my mother, here's the detailed pages on my mother, information on her father, uh, information on, uh, on herself, uh, information on, on the children, there's my father, Albert Charles Benedict. Here's the children. My, uh, that's my sister who's passed on, so her name is visible. Number two is me, and number three is my brother. It, it supports mapping. It supports images. We saw some of the images before. Here's an image of my mother when she was working. She worked to the age of 82. And uh, the uh, CEO of the company, just couldn't believe that he had an 82-year-old full-time employee working in the shop, working in the uh, downtown oil and gas office. She worked in the, the land records uh, division. And uh, 
she'd be the first one that would arrive at the building to open up, start the coffee, get the lights on, uh, get things going. And she put in about two hours of work before the other staff started showing up. So uh, she, she, a real trooper. I hope I got some of that blood uh, in me. But anyway, um, I'll go to the homepage here. So this is the homepage of my site on Weber Families of Canada. There's another gathering of my extended family and some site information here. But the thing for me, even though I maintain all the information in this, should I no longer be able to look after this website, the AFHS has taken on the responsibility to make sure that whatever work I've done is preserved and archived and is available to the public to see. So all of my handiwork is available here and will be visible as long as AFHS is around. Um, so uh, that's another way to preserve and, and, uh, and look after your family. Now, I'm also looking at the time. I'm coming up to the top of the hour. So with your indulgence, I'd like to show you one more thing. And that is um, the digging up of relatives, figuratively, of course. Another thing that uh, the AFHS has uh, uh, been working on is uh, the recording of cemetery records in Calgary and area. And we have a, uh, a fierce team of fearless uh, field uh, volunteers that over the past three decades have gone out into the cemeteries of Calgary taken photographs of headstones and recorded information. Uh, they've gone further uh, with permission. They have access to City of Calgary um, uh, Cemetery uh, Division, uh, Cemetery Department records that are not available. That's the homepage of the Alberta Family History Society. Here we go. And, and as such, uh, we wanted to feature that information somewhere on a website. So a new website has been created. It's called Alberta Ancestors. And it's concentrating on Calgary and area. And it's a June, is a, a prototype website, okay? It's just uh, being put together now. Parts of it work, parts of it don't work. And if it doesn't work, wait a little while. We're working on it. Uh, hopefully by the end of the year, we're gonna be in fine shape, but this is a starting point. This is a home page on it, but it's primarily on uh, cemeteries and burial of people. Right now we have uh, four cemeteries for sure set up in it. We have uh, Union, Burnsland, uh, St. Mary's, St. Mary's uh, Pioneer. I think we have a, a couple more that are sort of outlying areas, Gladys uh, Cemetery and the like. Uh, things will really get rolling when we get uh, Queens Park entered in, which is the next big project. How do you work this? Well, uh, you can look at the search area here. Search for, and there's a bit of a description here on how to use it. Let's search on my surname. So I'll start typing in Benedict and you'll notice it gives me a pop-up list as I type of uh, the first matches it's found of what I'm looking for. I'll put in an E, that narrowed it down nicely. There's Benedict. If I click on it, Oh, just before I do that, over here, it shows you the total number of persons and plots and cemeteries and something called narratives that we have in the site to start with. We're at 25,800 persons, but I'm gonna click on the word Benedict. You'll see the numbers change instantly. Now it shows me how many people it has found and plots it has found that matches that name. I can now click on persons and it'll take me to a new page it gives me a list of the eight matches that it has found in the cemeteries we have recorded so far. For Benedict, I've got Agnes and Jack and Norman and uh, Hubert John and a John, a Mary, a Bertha and a Peter George. The last one is my uh, grandfather, Peter George Benedict. I can hover over the name here and I can get a little further information, but I can see when he was born, when he died, at what age, and if I, that he was buried in Union Cemetery, and then I can view the plot. View plot means click here and I get a pop-up. And here's the information on my grandfather, Peter George Benedict. I can click on the image here and I can get a full viewing of the um, gravestone itself. 
So um, if you have, uh, let me clear this off here. Let, let's say you have a location that, now the McPhail's is another line of my family. And here's Agnes Rowe, who is my, uh, my grandmother, and I can view plot. And now it shows me the, the, the four names that are registered against that headstone. And not only that, but I can also scroll through here and see the different shots. And any of them I can click on and get a full view. So that's what we're working on. This is really becoming an interesting project and it will be, become even better as we go along. We're also finding that there, there's pioneers buried in Calgary and they have uh, stories and notable people. So we decided to have some fun with this and we thought, we, well, let's make it possible to add narratives on the pioneers. So I go to the main menu and I see something here called narratives and I click on it. The intent is to come up with something that looks like a newspaper of notable people that are found in there. So here we have uh, Guy Wiedek, very appropriate, what with the Calgary Stampede that we had just gone through and right up on him. Here's Vera Dick, she was a survivor of the Titanic. Down here we have Sam Livingston and John Ware, William Aberhart, and a write up on the stories. If you refresh the page, it randomly picks from the back end data bank. Uh, other information, now these are more of the same people just organized differently on the page. Please bear with, uh, we're in the process of improving this whole thing, but the concept is uh, you can then click on a read more on the, from the newspaper page if you want, and you'll be taken to the page of that individual person. The more detailed biography, eventually we'll have obituaries, burial plot details and so on and so forth. So that's another tool that's available to you in doing your family research if your roots are in Calgary. So that is my presentation. So I wanna thank everyone for, uh, for bearing with and, uh, and coming through this. Hopefully uh, you're now thinking about what stages you have left to go to uh, work on your family studies. You have help, you have a lot of online help. You have the uh, Alberta Family History Society you have the Calgary Public Library. There's other societies such as uh, uh, Chinook Country and so on and so forth uh, to contact. I wish you the best of luck on doing your, your family studies. It's an incredible journey you're gonna go on. And you will be thanked by your families at the next family reunion, guaranteed. We do have a number of questions, so I would like to take those up with you. Uh, with the newer generations getting involved, how the genealogy search will change? All the software packages have to keep up with today's uh, trends. All the packages have to keep up with uh, all the information that's available online. Um, at this point, there's very few packages that tie into, for example, Facebook or uh, Twitter or uh, applications like that. And, um, but, but that's going to come along. There, there's going to be uh, bridges that will be made between the, the newer tools. Um, uh, the new generation is, is getting into things like TikTok and YouTube. So it's not just a matter of, of the text information. It's just not, not a matter of, of images anymore. It's also uh, uh, video that's coming along. There are some people that record their, their, their life stories with, with uh, daily recordings, which is an incredible amount of recording. I have no idea how that's going to uh, play going forward. But again, uh, the younger generation uh, turned to uh, uh, Facebook and TikTok and Twitter to stay in touch with uh, their various cousins and so on. I'm having a Zoom meeting with uh, one of my uh, Atchison cousins in Idaho later this afternoon. And uh, you know, that way of staying in touch is also vitally important. But uh, the old fashioned way of, 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 of keeping, keeping your own records, however you're going to do it, be it spreadsheets, uh, be it family tree maker, or be it family genes and so on, it's still incredibly important to know where you came from, how far back you can go, where your roots are and, uh, and be able to tell that story going forward.
Thank you, Jim. Uh, we have another question regarding uh, the software that you used earlier to publish your uh, publish a book on your mother. Um, yes. So does ancestral author pull from your computer only or does it uh, do a web search, uh, uh, look it up in the websites? Uh, can you direct it into a particular site, that software that you used? Yes, you can direct it into a particular site. Now, you, you end up creating a document and that document is a PDF document. So any website that can carry PDF documents can carry that. The, uh, the, the other handy thing about the, the PDF document is you have control of what goes into it. Uh, nobody else is going to muck around with what you've done. It's a PDF document, it's locked in place. So you know that your, your study is preserved with the best information that you have, but you can include it in, uh, in websites for those websites that can hold PDF documents. Uh, the one that I was showing off on uh, my, uh, uh, my Weber family, uh, under family genes, that can hold uh, PDF documents as well as images. So uh, in terms of the software itself, it, it's a software application that you download from their website and you install it on your computer and you use it like any other computer application. Okay. Uh, are there different programs to use different nationalities or locations of source? There are different webs, uh, online resources that are stronger for certain regional areas than others. Ancestry started off being very strong uh, for North America, particularly the United States. My heritage was strong for uh, the United Kingdom. So you'll find that um, there are resources of census, birth, marriage, death, uh, uh, records, immigration, and so on will be stronger for those particular regions. Uh, so decide where your, your prime research is going to be. Is it going to be uh, Canada-centric, uh, US-centric, uh, UK-centric? Uh, there are, there's another one uh, whose name escapes me right, right, now, right now that is strong uh, coming from Israel, for example. They all have their different flavors and they all, all have their different prices. One thing I'll mention is uh, both at the Calgary Public Library and at the AFHS Library, you do have access to Ancestry.com from the library uh, computers. Yeah, that's true. Um, is there a listing of those sites for each country? Like for the um, programs, different programs from different nationalities? Is there a listing of those sites? No, there, there isn't per se, but uh, if you do um, uh, do a, uh, an online search for um, uh, family tree software, comparison, for example, or what is the best family tree application uh, when the results come back, the reviewers will tell you the strengths and uh, advantages of the different applications. And then you can have a look through that, decide what your price break is going to be. I also encourage you to go down to the Alberta Family History Society Library and talk to the volunteers there who can certainly guide you through what's available. And there are some on-shelf books that also talk about uh, family tree applications. Okay, thank you. And any other question? Uh, will you be publishing volume three of the Benedict, Benedict <laughs> history? <laughs> if I had another 50 years, I'd have a different answer for you. So I'm gonna give you this answer. And that is, uh, it's gonna come out uh, in digital format. I showed you my online way of doing my, my, my Weber and my um, Atchison family using that TNG application. Well, I've also got one running for, for Benedict and I am using that to capture all the information that's in the books and adding new information. And what I'm going to be doing is bringing on board uh, uh, a number of other Benedict volunteers to assist with it. And the nice thing these days is it doesn't matter where they're located. They can help. All the scanning of the documents that I've done, I'll be able to have a library that I can share with them and then they can transcribe the information into the TNG site. And we're gonna be bu building up volume three online for all the people interested in Benedict. So that's the way it's gonna be done. And if I'm not around, I have a bunch of volunteers carrying on. 
that's great. Uh, another question, um, asking for advice, best options or ideas for storing scanned family photos on, in cloud. Um, this person's parents are scanning and labeling them, but they don't know where, how to store uh, them so that they are accessible uh, by the rest of the family working on the family project. And they're currently using legacy. So is okay. there, yeah. Uh, well, I, I've not used legacy myself, um, but there's a, there's a couple, various tools available for storing images on, on, on the cloud for other people to access. Google Docs is one. Uh, Dropbox is another. Microsoft has something called OneDrive, which I do use. And you can protect it from intruders, and yet you can share folders with other uh, trusted people who can then upload pictures and, uh, and store inf not only pictures, but also documents, be it spreadsheets or write-ups on the family or what have you. Uh, one of the things is you do need somebody to be kind of a uh, your archive master who uh, sets up how the uh, storage boxes are organized or subfolders, if you will, so that the uh, information is put into places that uh, will be readily findable by somebody else that needs to work with the information. So you, you have to think of how you're going to do that. Are you going to have uh, it organized by decade? Are you going to have it organized by uh, by name, or you can have it organized by by generation. But one, once you set a system up, uh, then everybody should follow that. And also, the naming of images uh, can be a real hodgepodge. Having a file named um, uh, "Doggy's Birthday 2017" doesn't help very much. Or uh, cameras will uh, have file named like uh, "DC003456.jpg." That means nothing. So think about how you're going to do that. I either change the, the name of the image so it means something to other people, or you're going to have to put in a spreadsheet that gives you a, a listing of image names and a description of what they are, and away you go. But ultimately, you import it into your legacy, you import it into uh, your family tree maker, or I encourage considering uh, the TNG application with Alberta Family History Society that beautifully organizes everything else for you. Uh, I also didn't get into it, but if, if your uh, crowd here would like to look into something called Evernote, let's do a Google search for Evernote. Again, another tool you subscribe to. That's a great uh, researcher and organizer tool for capturing images, information on images, and, and tagging images, it's not only sorting and storing, but also recall. I use it Evernote quite a lot. Thank you. Uh, we have another question. I'm uh, I'm also actually very interested in <laughs> No, that's, um, are you at all concerned about privacy, especially for living people? Like all, all the that time. Info yeah. All the time. And as the researcher, it's my responsibility to protect that information. So yes, I am concerned. But all the applications have uh, different methodologies for you to protect the visibility of people. When I was showing off uh, the, uh, the family list for my, uh, for example, my, uh, my grandfather's line, you'll note that uh, the way I have it set up is uh, you could see my, my sister's name fully displayed. She's passed on. But my name and my brother's name, uh, the given names are just abbreviations. You don't see our names. You don't see our birth uh, or marriage information or anything else. That is protected. And you have to come to me for a password to be able to see that information. So it's only people I trust that would be able to see it. Uh, so what you can do is you, you, with a tool like that, you can protect living information from the general public but all of your trusted family members that are working with you on doing uh, your family research, they will get a, uh, an access name and a password and you allow them to go in. You might allow them just to uh, submit information. You may allow them to actually do some editing. You may allow them to do certain other things. You have those 
levels of permission that's under your control as a master of the website. So yes, protecting living people or, or families that wish to remain private, there might be an unexpected uh, birth in the family that does not want to be announced, or you might have some uh, banditos uh, that are a little notorious and away you go. So, but you, you have those controls. Oh, okay. In these programs, can you add family stories? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Okay. Um, you know, because the, the, the family tree is a skeleton. It's, it's what holds everything together and organizes it. But you want to add, you want to add flesh and blood and organs and all the other things that truly, truly makes it a family study. So yes, yes, you can add family stories. Different tools do it in different ways, but uh, definitely uh, get out there and collect the family stories. I didn't mention it, but while you have uh, your relatives alive, now is the time to collect those stories. Uh, if you can't get to them, you got Zoom. Encourage them to talk about it. There, there's different techniques to get uh, older people comfortable with talking about stories. I've got a lot of uh, recordings. The um, uh, uh, when when I did that uh, little booklet on my mother, for example, that write up, those are her own words. Back in 1977, she was a member of the uh, Thorncliffe Greenview Seniors Group. And uh, she, she was invited to speak before the body of, of seniors about her life story. And luckily it was uh, recorded uh, on, a, on a movie camera. And I was able to transcribe she, her story in her own words and put it in the booklet, which can then be put into uh, my, my personal uh, family software or online if I wish. So oh, yeah. That's amazing. It, and it was it was fun. It was great. Uh, and Sony says that's great. We have very few of my great grandparents. And uh, when I started, I was in exactly the same situation. I don't even remember my grandparents. Um, they were uh, they had basically passed on. So I, I got to know my grandparents through my aunts and uncles. They didn't know about the great grandparents. So I dug further into other books. You can find some information with uh, access to online newspapers. If they had marriages, if, if they had births and so on, they tended to be recorded in, in those newspapers. Uh, sources like My Heritage and Ancestry ha have other documents that you can access. And so you can access dates of births, marriages and deaths, and you can use the newspapers to get the context of the times. You, there, there's all kinds of books on uh, growing up on the prairies or, uh, you know, uh, soldiers returning from World War I or so on and so forth. Uh, you, have, you have more resources than you realize once you start uh, digging into this thing and you can put together the book on your family. It, it can be rather amazing. My, uh, my grandfather, um, Joseph uh, Weber, his nickname was Rusi because he used to play lacrosse and he, he would be able to dodge around the other players to shoot into the net. So he would roost around them. So they called him Rusi. That's a family story. He came from Alsace, France. Why did he come from Alsace, France? Because uh, the uh, German, uh, Germany and France were fighting over Alsace Lorraine. So the family fled to Canada. That's, now I researched the war and now I've got that side of the story and so on and so forth. It's, it, there's a, a lot of information out there. Just, just takes due diligence. You can put together some remarkable stories on your family. And just a comment, absolutely. The family history needs to have context of the era. That makes sense. Totally with you on that. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's what makes it interesting. Otherwise, it, family research can be very dry. Uh, it, it's the context of it. It's how they lived their times. It, it, it's how they got to Calgary. If Calgary's your, your base, how did, how did your ancestors actually arrive here? Where did they come from? What drove them to come there? What, what, did a famine take place? Uh, what, were there wars happening? Were there opportunities to, uh, to farmstead in, in the prairies? And, and so on and so forth. Uh, 
those are all, and each of us has a remarkable story on our family. It's just waiting to be discovered. Thank you very much, Jim, for this presentation and Sherry for organizing it. And to our attendees, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you, Jim. You've shown us how easy it can be to create that family history book. And thank you also for explaining the new Alberta Ancestors website. Thanks to Lale and Zaritza at the Calgary Public Library. And thank you to our viewers for joining us for this presentation. Please remember to check out our website at chinookhistory.ca for information regarding all historic Calgary Week programs, virtual and in-person.